Brad, Rob, thank you both for coming on the show here. Thanks for having us. Great, thanks. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So as you both know, I want to focus this conversation on just Anna's relations in cybersecurity and how these different firms such as Gartner and Forrester have been providing value to the community for decades at this point, but also how that perspective is starting to change and just how the industry as a whole is evolving based on both of your backgrounds with these analyst firms and how you're still participating in the ecosystem today. You're the perfect people to talk about this topic. Now, before we get there, I do want to talk about your backgrounds a little bit. And so we'll go kind of one by one, how you ended up at Gartner and ultimately, again, how this kind of ties into your whole career arc here. So maybe starting with Brad then. Brad, you were working as a senior product manager for several big security companies. You're with Dell, you're with IBM, and then you're with Acquia. And after all those experiences, you ended up jumping into Gartner, where you focused on similar topics as far as endpoint, security monitoring, et cetera. What was it specifically about kind of working in that sort of research position that that drew you in? Yeah, um, uh, really, actually, I was originally thrown into cybersecurity uh, hmm. when I joined the military as an army officer. Uh, my undergrad was in business and um, I had, you know, over the course of the period of time, I got my MBA and, and really that was my core function. Uh, but the military had other other plans. So they <laughs> basically said, hey, you're going to learn cybersecurity. Not only that, you're going to learn it for the military intelligence. And that's kind of how I got intertwined with both communities, which um, are very unique in the way that they go about things. And um, eventually, once I left the military, I landed at uh, Dell, that SecureWorks, which was very quickly acquired by Dell. And while I was there, I was actually a user of uh, different, uh, uh, and basically analyst research, you know, yep. partner, Forrester, so on and so forth. And as a product, as initially a SOC manager, and then a product manager, I originally learned that, um, you know, this was really good insights in, and really trying to, you know, take the things that I was learning on the front lines and then apply it to either the services we were trying to deliver as a managed security service provider or uh, from a design perspective and designing better products. Um, so back in 2013, we were taking our incident response tool called Red Cloak at the time and evolving it to be more of an endpoint detection response. And that's um, actually where I got intertwined with Anton Trevankin. So he's a you know well-renowned uh, Gartner veteran uh, now at Google. And um, he basically coined the, the, the term, which originally used to be endpoint threat detection and response, by the way, uh, hmm. and, and, and eventually evolved into EDR. And I just kind of fell in lo- love with the concept that you could you know take something that was completely, you know, out there, you know, it was really in terms of you know, a large amount of confetti, and then taking that confetti, categorizing it, and then mm-hmm. bringing it down to earth, so people could really conceptualize and understand it, and how that works as part of the larger cybersecurity uh, industry. So, it took me about three and a half years of applying uh, <laughs> <laughs> to eventually get into Gartner, but um, you know that that was pretty much my journey, and um, you know, and and how I got to where I am today, but. Um, yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about the kind of badge of honor that comes with coining a new term <laughs> at Gartner, just because, again, yeah. from an outsider's perspective, there's this idea that, oh, Gartner's always coming up with some new term to define a new area of the ecosystem to the point where some people get frustrated with all the acronyms, right? But it adds that little of like, oh, if people internally are kind of seeing that as a badge of honor to coin a new term, then there's that additional incentive to, to kind of keep categorizing these different spaces. And again, that's not to knock on it at all. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in continuing to delineate as tools continue to specialize. Uh, So Rob, let's turn over to you. You were a CEO of a managed security services company, which you co-founded. And then you were also a CTO of a different company, which was focused on mobile security. So I think you were doing each of those for roughly five years or so before you ended up joining Gartner and long career in cybersecurity before that. But I mean, specifically, what was it that was so like interesting to you about Gartner that it could pull you away from these companies that you'd built from the ground up? Well, the short version is IT retirement. 
Um, <laughs> that's how I used to describe Gartner. It was, you could stay in the game and you'd work nine to five. I'll never mm. forget my first week at Gartner, my manager, Bob Hoffner, um, because I had pre-booked a vacation uh, long before joining Gartner. And after about two weeks, weeks I was going on holiday and I said to my boss I said you know Bob I'm going on vacation um you know how often do you want me to check in how often do you want me to check email and he said leave your laptop at home you check email when you come back and I thought oh my god wow um my journey is a, a little bit different than Brad's in that because uh when you're a child of the 80s uh every child of the 80s who's in IT security we're all influenced by one thing, and that's uh, war games. Uh, and when I was 13, I went to saw war games when it came out. And I came home, and I became a teenage hacker. Um, I, I literally got a war dialer and war dialed my local prefix and <laughs> hacked into several local open systems that were running at the time so that I could get free video games, just like in war games. That's, that's awesome. Classic 80s hacker story um but then i gave it all up when i turned 18 because when you're 18 they can send you to a lovely place called jail <laughs> and in those days there were no uh laws against teenage hacking it was only when you were 18 they would go after you and was so that i a, gave it up let me stop you for a second there i mean was that a specific law that they had to create like yes they had to create a separate law specifically for teenage hacking correct it yes. didn't exist it wasn't a crime because it was, it was just out of the scope of reality. You know, nobody ever imagined the concept of hacking, let alone the fact that you'd have kids all across America becoming hackers. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. yeah. What all a right. Concept, Continue, huh? please. It, it's uh, technology ahead of, uh, of the laws. I mean, we have this problem today, of course. And it's, look, uh, you know, coming to Brad and EDR, only last year did the U.S. government come out and say you need EDR. <laughs> so it's always a case where the government and laws, the legal system, lag significantly behind uh, what people are actually capable of. And that's right. why the hackers will always win. Um, so in 97, I started working for a small startup called Secure IT. Uh, where we were doing something very unusual, which was installing firewalls. And I became a product manager, uh, literally designing the first ever reporting tool for a checkpoint firewall. Hmm. And I, we were VeriSign's first acquisition, and I was lucky enough to be a dot-com kid. And out of being a dot-com kid, I left Atlanta and moved to Europe and started an MSSP, which I actually ran for 12 years. Wow. And if you ask me, the one thing I'm most proud of in my career uh, is this MSSP today, which started on my watch in 2005, the mm -hmm. global security for the United Nations. Wow. And so Brad and I both have extensive government ties. In my case, it's literally, I used to joke that we manage firewalls in everywhere but Antarctica. <laughs> and out of that, I started a mobile security company. Uh, which was in Gartner's first ever MDM Magic Quadrant. Uh, but I made a huge mistake in those days, which is still true now, in that nobody actually cares about mobile security. And feel free to have a whole nother long conversation about that. Right. But people think mobiles are safe and don't realize the risks associated, unlike what they do with cloud and desktop. And so when I sold that off and I sold off my MSSP, my wife said, hey, this is, you know, you're working too much. And so in 2013, for a lark, I applied to be a Gartner analyst. It didn't mm -hmm. take me three and a half years. It took me three and a half weeks. Uh, <laughs> but it was just simply because they were desperate. They had uh, two different analysts quit at the same time and mm -hmm. they had a big opening and they walked me in basically. And so, I mean, as far as the timing for each of you, right, you both joined at, I'm sure, very different times in Gartner. I think, Rob, for you, it was around maybe 2013, like you said, and Brad, for you, as I think 2019. Is that right for both of you? Yeah, that's right. And I actually in, uh, was interviewed by Rob and another, okay. you know, seven right. other I didn't panelists. Like, yeah. 
<laughs> he, didn't, he didn't like me, but most people don't like me when they meet me and then they learn to love me. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a virus. Yeah. He grows on you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Rob, maybe for you then, from the time when you joined to the time when Brad joined, what were some of the changes that you were already seeing take place within Gartner just to kind of address, I mean, if I think about that six year period there from 2013 to 2019, there were huge changes just in terms of the amount of money flowing into cybersecurity as a whole and the amount of attention that it was starting to gain on a really national and international scale. So how was Gartner adapting internally to that? We were always short and the, mm. you know, mm-hmm. we're always short of analysts today. The fact of the matter is when you become an analyst, you don't become an analyst to get rich. You can't have stock. You have to be extremely impartial. Um, you become an analyst because, well, it's IT retirement. It's uh, stable, <laughs> recurring re- mm-hmm. revenue, you know, recurring income, uh, predictable. But more importantly, in my case, it's because it was a tour of the world five star. Yeah, mm-hmm. when we, right at the end of when Brad was hired, there were major changes. But in 2013, I was literally hired with a job description of a third, a third, a third. Mm-hmm. A third researching and writing, mm-hmm. a third being on the telephone with clients doing uh, what Gartner calls inquiries, which I call IT therapy calls, <laughs> where you give people advice, and a third traveling the world, business class, and staying in five-star hotels and speaking on stage. And one day you're in Australia, and then you take a couple of days off scuba diving. And then the next day you're in (laughs) India for a few days. And then you go see the Taj Mahal, or you go to the Chinese Great Wall. It, um, as a job pre-COVID, Gartner was really probably the best place in all of IT to work, Hmm. hands down. So, I mean, I'm curious then, right, Rob, you keep tying back to this idea of IT retirement, right? But you were a good bit further on in your career before you joined Gartner, very different scenario for Brad. So, I mean, thinking for your situation, Brad, what was it that was kind of specifically the the element that attracted you to kind of that, that working style of Gartner and that team? Yeah, the second reason why people join firms like this, (laughs) and that's to make a name for yourself. So, sure. um, I have learned pretty much everything I could learn on the front lines. So I had run hmm. a stock in the government. I ran a stock for the private sector. I supported every vertical around the world. I, you know, helped stand up a stock in Japan, which is always a difficult element. I had moved uh, over three data centers across the United wow. States back and forth um, for a multitude of reasons. And, um, <laughs> and, and everything else that you can imagine. And I was like, I, think I know enough that I could get on calls as an analyst and advise people because right. eventually I did want to do what I'm doing now, um, which is basically being a extension of different startups. So right now right, I'm working right. with uh, roughly around 11 different startups right now in terms of you know helping them with their go to market. And it's really a culmination of things that I learned you know, over the past 20 years in terms of, you know, what right looks like from a business sense, from a technical sense, and then, you know, how to actually look at a market, what's the, you know, marketing mix, what's the different placements, differentiation and, and apply it. Uh, but in a way that's it's acting as a fulcrum and a wedge where you're, you're then catapulting that, that startup forward uh, right. uh, against the competition without, you know, spending a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think even just thinking about the kind of third, third, third approach that Rob put forward, clearly several of those are really boosting just kind of your visibility within the ecosystem as a whole. So that makes sense from from your position as well to kind of see it as a stepping stone towards that next aspect of your journey. So let's talk again a little bit about kind of analyst relations today and, and where we stand. There's a lot of folks who are at this point, I'd say fairly vocal, it's no longer really whispers, saying that some of these different research reports are just too expensive, uh, either to consume them or to be included in them as far as what those take. Um, Obviously, this price has gone up significantly over the years. And I think there's been a lot of pressure over time that, hey, you have to be paying for these, or you're just not uh, kind of staying in the game almost. I mean, what are your thoughts on on that perspective? Well, uh, I have unbelievable amounts of thoughts on that. Uh, Let's hear it. Let's start with magic quadrants because this is the report everybody knows. 
And my response is always the same. Uh, magic quadrants aren't what you know, but what you can prove. And as a Gartner analyst, you may have all kinds of inside dirt on a company, but if it's not public and you can't prove it, you can't use it. <laughs> and so as an MQ, former MQ lead author, um, it, it becomes very much a legal challenge. And magic quadrants are, you know, they affect stock prices. And so it really matters um, the research that goes into an MQ. There's lots and lots of, analyst firms out there that are pay to play. I'll never mm. forget when Mobile Active Defense, we want one, I use the term one loosely, Frost and Sullivan Innovation Award or something like that. And it cost us $20,000. It was ridiculous to tell anyone yep. about it. Um, Gartner, on the other hand, we'll put you in a magic quadrant if you want us to or not. Um, mm. And that was very much um, about the research. Now, that said, if I don't know anything about you and I don't understand you and don't understand your position, odds are you're gonna have a worse position in a magic quadrant. So what you tend to see is clients that do better in magic quadrant are typically Gartner clients, but it's not because they're paying for the privilege of being in a magic quadrant, it's the exact opposite. It's just that they have briefed analysts, they know how to communicate with analysts and how to mm. get analysts attention. Um, I, so, I, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I appreciate all the insight here as far as the, the behind the scenes, right? I'm curious as you're saying that, I mean, it sounds like then bigger companies, which have the kind of marketing dollars in order to, um, kind of fully expose all the various valuable features of their platform and, and gain some of that, um, industry recognition, as well as companies that have the ability to staff folks that are dedicated to like Gartner relationships, for example, then would have a huge advantage, right? Because if they have a full-time employee that's dedicated to making sure Gartner understands all the value of their product or in some ways salespeople, right? Because they're ultimately selling Gartner that, hey, their product is the best, then that gives them a huge advantage. So, I mean, what is Gartner then doing as far as these various analysts? And again, Gartner just has an example of one of these research firms, but what is Gartner doing in order to kind of actually look at the product themselves, get beyond some of that um, sales and marketing piece to have a more, um, let's say, accurate representation of a, of a tool skill sets. Brad, you want to take that? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and basically say sure. that bigger isn't necessarily better. Like we've certainly seen, you know, Fortune 500 companies put a ridiculous amount of money into analyst relations, but if you're not having the right conversations with the right people, the investment's not there. I mean, it's sure. you have to identify, you know, who is the the right analyst that you, you should be working with, like a lead for in Magic Quadrant, uh, so on and so forth. But like, you'd be amazed how many people just mess that up, um, hmm. or they go, you know, basically it's a, a lot of it's an art versus science. Where you know, I've sure. I've legitimately had. Have, have gotten quite upset with certain <laughs> organizations been the way that they you know because they'll book a call they won't show up they will lie to you there's you know there's a lot of things that end up happening behind the scenes that you know really tarnish your reputation i don't care mm -hmm. if you're a fortune 50 fortune 500 whatever company i mean if you can't have uh, a sensible uh, ethical compass and and you know basically be impeccable with your words to be quite quite um front upfront about it then you know th those are the areas that where the people get a lot of uh, in a lot right. of trouble um so, so it's not it's not tied to a specific money or amount of people it's uh, it's more of how surgical you are with your approach right and uh, I mean, i'll have one comment to that in that yeah please in one of my magic quadrants we had one vendor where <laughs> uh the lead product manager is german and if he listens to this, he'll know I'm talking about him in that way, <laughs> uh, without naming him. And this guy was simply incapable of lying. Mm. And where pretty much every other vendor would lie to us. And, you know, some much more than others, like Brad said. Yeah. And so we as analysts would almost, you know, take that into account and give them a little bit of a bonus because they, we knew sure. they were telling the truth. And, and so credibility 
you know, the security industry, we're all one degree of separation from each other. Right. And so one of my uh, standard lines I, I tell everybody is deal, uh, reputation matters most. Deals come and go, but reputation stays. Hmm. And this is really, truly an industry where we all know each other. And so if you're just being that blatant to a Gartner analyst or any other analyst firm or influence or whatever, um, it's going to come back to bite you at some point. And right. this is why I say MQs are trials, because the evidence ends up coming out. Magic quadrants don't take a day to produce. They take eight or nine months. Yeah, and I think one of the big elements of this whole thing, right, is obviously any process that involves like analysts assessing a company is going to have some level of subjectivity that comes along with it, right? In some ways, that's part of the reason that they're there. And one of the things I was thinking of as far as uh, like the conversation that Brad or the discussion topic that Brad was just talking about, right, is these companies are in some ways getting penalized if they have like rude staff, for example, which I think in a lot of ways does say a lot about that company as a whole and, and the culture behind it and whether or not as a customer you want to work with that company. If everyone's going to be rude and unethical, um, then you don't want to work with them, right? I think that's a, a fair statement. But at the same time, that's also subjectivity that's coming into those reports uh, that's outside of kind of the, the specific capabilities of the product itself. So I'm curious, like, is there any core, like quantitative measurements that are used behind the scenes to say like, oh, here's how this product um, kind of competes with one another or compares to one another um, from like a very objective standpoint, or is as kind of ex-Gartner analyst, you should say, hey, the magic quadrant is designed to be a representation of the company as a whole, not just the product. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, if I could jump in there. Um, yeah, please. So there, there's actually a document that accompanies every magic quadrant that no one reads. <laughs> and yeah. the mass majority of the inquiries that I had was around the fact that, you know, there's uh, basically a critical capabilities. And this is specific to Gartner. Um, and with the there's comparatives to other industries but we'll just pick on Gartner because of the biggest um but in it in uh the critical capabilities it's specifically a quantitative all of the reports do have a heavy component of quantitative analysis hmm. but in the critical capabilities it specifically ties the numbers of like okay well how good are you at detecting xyz or hmm. you know how good is your your ease of use what are customers saying? Like, what kind of feedback do we have from inquiries? What, what kind of feedback do we have from different customer reviews that are publicly available? And all of that gets seen where you you have a stack ranking effectively for each different category in, in the critical capabilities. Um, so comparatively to like a magic quadrant or forced wave, et cetera, it's primarily looked at from a uh, more strategic view and, and it layers in the business aspect of it. Right. It's not only you know, the strategy and, and whether or not they had one and and their execution against that strategy. And that's how you end up with the different axes uh, you know, across you know, whether they're a, uh, a, a leader, a visionary, a challenger right. or a niche type vendor based off their ability to, to execute it on their strategy. Yeah, and I think that's a- And by the a, way, all the dots are relative. So if you score somebody else very high yeah. and then somebody else also very high, then everybody else will move way down. Hmm, sure. It's not just a numeric value, it's also calculated on position as well. Hmm, exactly. Interesting. Yeah, and I think like to both of your, your points, right? I think there's a lot of, misconceptions as far as what the magic quadrant is like specifically addressing. And I think I'm guilty of that as well, right? In terms of like what specifically it's supposed to convey and how some of the information that's collected behind the scenes really informs that. Um, and I think to your point, Brad, that extra document that accompanies it, like I've never seen or heard of this. I think you'd mentioned it to me before, but uh, like seeing this document in the wild um, or like taking the time to really read through one of those word by word. Um, so I think to your point, there are a lot of misconceptions that come along with it. 
And a specific misconception, you actually mentioned this a little bit before we started recording here, Rob, is just vendor relations within this whole analyst community. And I think we've already heard some hints of that, right? In terms of, hey, some of these firms are investing in specific analyst relations teams. Some firms are just blatantly rude to Gartner analysts and that impacts their performance. Again, my perception, I think a lot of folks in the industry, their perception too is, oh, all these vendors just kind of cozy up to Gartner. And that's why it's kind of a, um, like, I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of idea. Uh, But maybe that's not quite the case. And I think, Rob, you were saying there's actually some tension with some of these different vendors and Gartner trying to kind of separate um, from those kind of specific uh, relationships. So, I'm curious as far as your thoughts on uh, just how vendor relations have evolved, have evolved and maybe how vendors specifically uh, see these different analyst firms today. Sure. Well, so let's start with some basics. Sure. If I was a vendor, I would be lying to Gartner. Full stop. <laughs> there, there's no reason to tell Gartner or any other analyst firm or any other influencer the truth. You want to put on your best face. It's Hollywood you have to remember that it's a, it really truly is a show because Gartner is gonna write about you. They are going to go talk to the end user community and tell them, hey, you, you know, vendor A told us they have all these problems where vendor B said everything is perfect. So right. you should really look at vendor B, not vendor A. And when, you know, the more they know the more dangerous it is because they're dealing with end users. And so it really is from an analyst relations and AR standpoint, it's about putting on your best face Hmm. to the analyst community. It's, you know, pardon the expression, lipstick on a pig. You've got to look as pretty as possible to make sure that you get the attention, even if your product is a dog, so that the analyst will write about you and talk about you. But I'll I'll take it now from the flip side as the Gartner analyst. If I don't know a product and don't understand the product and don't feel enough comfortable with the product, I'm not going to write about the product because, you know, when I said a third, a third, a third, those IT therapy calls are going to be coming my way where they're going to say, oh, yeah, you wrote up about vendor A. What can you tell us about them? And unless I have a a better understanding of them and how they operate as an analyst, I'm never going to write about them because I'm going to have to answer questions on them I can't answer. And then I look like an idiot. So it, it ultimately comes down to the balancing act between prettying yourself up as a vendor enough, educating the analyst to make sure they understand your GTM, but more Hmm. importantly, so that they feel comfortable enough where they can talk about you for a half hour without any hesitation. And then you get how this industry has evolved though. And we haven't touched on it yet, but I I think it's really truly most important to say that if I'm a, you know, a boomer, a Gen Xer, I'm calling up Gartner for buying decisions. Hmm. Gartner is the end all beat all source. But if I'm a Gen Z or a millennial, I could care less what Gartner or or Forrest or IBC or anybody else thinks. I'm looking at the influencer community. So to come back to your question, really, how it's changed, and it's really changed since 2019, is the strength of the influencer community. I it was funny, I was talking to a CMO the other day of a multi-billion dollar security firm, and I mentioned about influencers. And he's like, you mean like TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> and it just knew nothing. And it, those who don't understand how the industry is evolving is going to be left behind because hmm. the Zs and the millennials are going to the influencers to look at the technology. And then they're telling their boss, hey, go buy this, or then calling right. up the gardeners and foresters saying, hey, can we buy this company or not? But give it five, 10 years when the Zs and millennials start getting to be executives the the business model as we know it the analyst community as we know it has to radically change Hmm. yeah that's interesting to hear you and i'll let you go in a second brad but i was just gonna say it's it's interesting to hear you talk about it as specifically a, a generational gap and i think there's a lot that can be drawn from 
that kind of analysis, just in terms of the different ways these generations have grown up consuming information. Like for my generation, frankly, it's been so much free information available online that those are the habits that we've formed is when we have a question, we go see however we can find the answer to it online. And I think for the older generation, there's more a tradition of, hey, all that information you have to pay for to some extent. And there's a tradition of using these different analyst firms um, that exist out there. And so it's it feels normal and natural, whereas some of the folks that are getting into the game more recently don't have that um, kind of previous notion of, hey, this is how things are done. And so why don't I just go and see who's written articles recently on EDR, trying to grow their own influence and, and gain that publicity, and they're going to have great insight as well. But Brad, go ahead, please. Yeah, so let me just throw some stats out there um, and some <laughs> take some facts and figures and put it in the idea machine. Please. So uh, IDC was created back in 64, Gartner in 79, Forrester in 83. Uh, those firms were really successful because he, there was no internet, as you right. say. Like, I, I want to be able to pick up the phone and I have, I need to make a decision. I need to call someone that's really smart in a specific domain that can give me the answers so it, I can expedite that decision. And that I like to have that supported with some evidence, like white papers and the things that these organizations produce. Now, now, fast forward to, you know, <laughs> what, 40 years later, you know, basically, uh, it, over 40 years in terms of this and people don't read white papers anymore and the attention span to go through a 10 20 30 page white paper that doesn't exist right uh most people can't even get through like a short 500 1000 <laughs> word blog yeah. and i've seen the telemetry on it and the 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 metrics and you know when i joined gartner about 4 years ago like over 75% of readers of all of Gartner's research didn't get past the fourth page. So hmm. that was really disheartening when you're like being asked to write this long white paper about this hot topic that you're in the process of creating a category for. <clears throat> and then uh, and then basically, you know, from there, and, then, and we were seeing this major shift, especially, you know, everything with the rise of, you know, Instagram and, and TikTok and all these things, you know, it has a major factor on everything else. And if you look now, um, influencers and inf influencer relations are now the most <laughs> most influential thing in <laughs> marketing today as part of your go to market. So over 71% of organizations either agree or strongly agree that influencers that can actually come in and say, hey, yes, this is a really cool product. This is a great solution. You should check it out. Hmm. And, you know, it's things like that that push things forward and people aren't reading magic quadrants anymore or forester ways or things of that nature it doesn't have the same weight that it used to have uh, back in the day um and it's not just these analysts it's it, and it's more uh advisors and organizations that can actually help influence decisions and and really solve the core problem but in a completely different way sure and i think to that point right i think there's been more uh kind of consulting projects targeted around product selection over the last several years, just because so much money is going into these security tools now that it's worth mm -hmm. spending a few hundred thousand dollars to have consultants come in and say, hey, this is mm -hmm. absolutely the right solution for your specific organization. And so I think that's another trend that, uh, that to your point means, oh, well, maybe these long white papers aren't uh, quite as valuable. Now, it's kind of silly to think about it that way that, hey, you won't read a 10 to 20 page white paper, but you'll spend $300,000 and mm -hmm. hundreds of hours on a consulting project. But <laughs> I mean, maybe that's, a, again, not a kind of direct decision that's being made. The other piece that I did want to actually tie together that I think is an interesting tie of, of what we've talked about here already, this idea that, hey, folks won't even read like 1000 page or sorry, 1000 word uh, LinkedIn articles anymore, right? Like they yeah. might skim for the header, understand like what the intro is about and then skip to the conclusion and boom, sure, they've they've captured kind of the, the core essence of it, right? Uh, and we've talked about how oh, white papers are too long, but 
I think that's maybe the appeal of Magic Quadrant still in some ways and, and why there is more kind of frustration around Magic Quadrant specifically, because it distills all this information behind the scenes, like we've talked about, into something that is consumable in like 45 seconds and seeing, okay, if you're looking at it from a surface level, here are the companies and how they're performing. Now, again, everything we've talked about says there's a lot more information that's going into this um, than being able to just say, okay, here's the leader and this is the company that you should go with. Um, but again, I think those kind of quick consumable pieces of information have uh, kept Gartner competitive in some ways, or at least popular uh, because that can be consumed by so many people. So one of the other pieces I'm curious about here is we've talked a lot about how this kind of model is changing, how there's so many different uh, competitors and different ways to find information today. But I was also looking at Gartner's stock performance over the last decade or so, and their stock has gone up 10x since 2010 or so. So, I mean, what do you both think from kind of a, a business model standpoint? And again, maybe this ties into them just charging higher prices, they've been able to kind of continue to grow uh, their just business prominence. And again, I think that ties into some of the, the frustration that exists in the ecosystem. But maybe Rob, what are your thoughts on just how Gartner has been able to separate that kind of business performance piece from the, um, again, just some of the gripes that folks in the industry have? Sure. So as far as Gartner, you know, if you take the big analyst firms, and you're an enterprise IT security vendor, you're, the lion's share of your budget for analyst firms should go to Gartner, full stop. Hmm. And Wall Street's recognized that um, because of the magic quadrant and because people look at that graphic and say, oh, I'll only buy a leader. And if they're right. not a leader, they're not worth paying attention to, which by the way, was probably my single biggest gripe ever, especially as somebody who was a niche vendor in the first ever MDM magic quadrant. Right. Um, the niche vendors are the interesting ones to look at because they, they're doing something specific that no one else really is offering. And so Gartner has been able to take the success and really propel the stock price. I mean, at one point the stock was even over 300 and even with a downturn in the market, it's still doing extremely well. Like you said, 10X yep. is pretty much what it was. Uh, when I was started, it was in the low 80s. And so it's um, it's done exceptionally well because they are the industry standard, but they are the industry standard today. Um, as we've talked about the influencer space and how things are evolving. And this is one of the reasons why Brad and I left Gartner is because we saw how the world was changing. And when we started our new company, Lionfish Tech Advisors, it was really designed to solve two problems for the vendor community. Um, the first problem, um, quite frankly, was the fact that analysts aren't allowed to tell you what they always think. Uh, we as Gartner analysts are directed to give vendors really two or three answers and not say, do this. Hmm. Uh, but in Gartner's defense, the reason we were told that is because vendors always lie to Gartner. And, so how can you give direct actionable advice if you don't truly know where all the bodies are buried? And so these were the two problems we wanted to solve with Lionfish, to be able to know point blank that you can give direct actionable advice, but also that you could know where all the bodies are buried. And in order to do that, that takes a level of trust to know that we're not working with competition and not working with end users. And hmm. so each advisor in Lionfish can only have one vendor, one specific technology space. Oh, interesting. I only support one EPP vendor, for example, and one SASE vendor. Yet yeah. we support multiple within Lionfish, but that way the vendor can trust you. And it, it comes down to the, you want to know what a Gartner analyst thinks, but in order to find out what the Gartner analyst thinks, they have to understand completely who you are. So this whole advisory business from Lionfish and others is really about understanding what's wrong with the vendor community and then how to position them moving forward from this traditional analyst relations where 90% you know, of your AR budget goes right. to really looking at the influencer space to get that attention for future 
but then not forget and leave behind the traditional analyst worlds so that when that buying decision comes down, you're actually talking to them and saying, oh, yeah, Gartner says you're a good company, so buy them. That's a good decision. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that piece as far as kind of how Lionfish is going about that approach. Um, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. And I think it'll be interesting to see if that model does prove to be successful, maybe how some of these bigger analyst firms start to adopt something similar. Because you would think the bigger firms would have even more resources in order to be able to kind of specialize individuals on individual companies and how that changes the dynamic. Uh, but clearly that's kind of an innovative way of, of looking at the space as a whole. Um, and so one last question to, to wrap up here. Uh, it's more of a fun one. Uh, the name Lionfish. So I, when I learned to scuba dive, I was in Nicaragua and they had lionfish, which was an invasive species. And the dive master would actually bring a spear into the water and shoot lionfish and feed them to nurse sharks. Uh, because again, invasive species, they were trying to clear them out and teach nurse sharks to hunt lionfish. So I'm curious, uh, I'm sure it's not related to that specific story, but how did the name lionfish come about? Well, it's it actually is sort of related to that specific okay. story. I'm a hardcore scuba diver. Oh, uh, fun. I've been diving since, well, I, and this sounds really bad, but probably before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to live in Costa Rica. I've done well north of a thousand dives. I stopped logging my wow. dives years ago. Um, and I've dove all over the world. And before lionfish was in the Caribbean, it was easily, uh, you know, my favorite fish to see in the world. There's a few things about them. They're apex predators. So, you know, nothing will touch them on the reef and kill them. They're mm. very cool to look at. Yet, if you mess with them, they're poisonous. Right. So they come in and and they're an invasive species. They come in and they take over and they make the place theirs. So as lionfish, we come in. You don't want to mess with us. We're, <laughs> if you mess with us, we're, you're going to get burned and we're going to help you and we're going to protect you because mm. we are the apex predator and we're going to help you become really more and uh, for lack of a better expression, become instead of a little fish, a bigger fish hmm. and be protected by the big fish who understand how the reef works and how the ecosystem works. And so that's where it all came from is from scuba diving. Interesting. Awesome. I like it. It's a kind of refreshing um, new mascot as far as like apex predators go. So rather than going with a, a jaguar, shark, very so, new. Uh, yeah. You know. How exactly. many shark companies are there? Yeah. <laughs> Too many. Yeah. Awesome. Many. Well, again, thank you both so much for the time. I think this will be insightful for a lot of people. I know it's interesting uh, just for myself in order to get a better understanding of how these firms are working behind the scenes and how companies are responding uh, to some of these different trends within the industry. So again, really appreciate the time. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you.